Hello, my dear students. Welcome to my channel. So today we are going to do chapter number seven, that is rise of British power in India. So, ICSE class eight history, chapter number seven, rise of British power in India. So in this chapter, we'll study about uh, the advent of British uh, in India, how the Britishers came to India, and how they became the master of uh, Bengal, and eventually the entire India was brought under their control. So in this chapter, we'll discuss about uh, Battle of Plassey, Battle of Buxar, okay, and then final establishment of British power in entire Bengal as well as in India, okay. <music> So before that, we need to understand about uh, what East India Company was, where was East India Company formed, okay. So let us start uh, and I request uh, all the dear students to watch this video till the end. So this video is going to be a complete video on this chapter number 7. That means one video which will cover entire chapter number 7 that is the rise of British power in India. We need to understand before going through the rest of the part of history like modern India, isn't it like uh, British rule, Mahatma Gandhi. So how the company, how East India Company eventually became the master of uh, Bengal and then how it shifted. That means the power of Bengal shifted into the hands of the British. Uh, ultimately, we are going to discuss in this chapter. Okay. So let us start with uh, the first paragraph. So you can see here uh, the first paragraph. So whenever you study any chapter, the first paragraph is the introduction of the chapter. What all are included in this chapter? It is mentioned in this uh, first paragraph. So you can see here, uh, British came to India as traders. So many of the students last time when I was uh, doing the interactive class there, I found that uh, many of the students did not know why British came to India? So the answer is British came to India not to rule, but they came as a trader. But eventually, when the situation was favorable for them, they became the masters. Okay, they, they became the ruler of this country. So first of all, one point is that uh, Britishers came to India as a trader in which century? 17th century. Okay, in 17th century, East India Company came to India. Okay. With that, the beginning of a, a rule, a European rule started in our country. <clears throat> so, in the middle of a 19th century, British succeeded in eliminating. Okay, so you can see here it is mentioned British succeeded in eliminating all the rivals. So, which all rivals they are talking about? It is not the English company was the first to come to India. You know that uh, Portuguese were the one. Portuguese were the one to first of all come and settle in India. Okay, so you know Vasco da Gama. Okay, you might even heard about uh, Christopher Columbus. So they were the earlier explorers. So Vasco da Gama discovered the new sea route to India. He was from Portugal. So they were also there. So Portuguese was there. Dutch company was there. They already had come earlier than East India Company. Okay, so in the 19th century, first of all, before establishing their rule power in India, they eliminated, okay, what is the meaning of eliminated, this mentioned over here, removing. So after removing all their rivals from India, they established an all India empire in India, okay, that means all India empire established after eliminating all those rivals like Portuguese were there, Dutch were there, okay, they were removed, they, uh, for, for, that means a war took place between English and Dutch, English and uh, Portuguese, they were defeated and then the East India Company was left as a sole power in Bengal. Okay, so you can see here, in the scramble for political power, what is the meaning of scramble? Meaning of scramble is make one's way quickly. That means to make one's way quickly for political power. Okay, the conquest of Bengal proved to be an important milestone. What is the meaning of milestone over here? Event marking a significant change. The meaning of milestone is event marking a significant change for the British. Okay. First of all, they uh, became the master of Bengal. Then they became the master of uh, India later on. Okay. So let us start uh, about East India Company. So 
East India Company was established in the year 1600 CE. Okay, when was East India Company established? It was established in 1600 CE. Okay, a company popularly known as East India Company. Okay, East India, English East India Company was established in 1600 C. Okay, century. Okay, 1600 C. So before you can see, it is means 17th century. What is the uh, 17th century means? 17th century means 1600 to 1700. Okay, that is 17th century. 17 cent 1700 to 1800 is 18th century. Nine 1800 to 1900 is 19th century. Okay, so today we are 21st century. Okay, so you can see here. So in 1600 CE, that is Christian era, English East India Company was established by a group of British merchants. Okay, group of merchants decided, British merchants decided to form a company and then they wanted to trade with the East. Before uh, doing so, they needed a permission. So Queen Elizabeth I. At that time, who was the Queen of England? Elizabeth I was the Queen of England. She granted the company exclusive right, okay, complete and absolute right to trade with us. They were given the permission or we can say they were given the trading right, okay, to trade with the East. First of all, they took the permission from Queen. A queen permitted them and then they started doing trade with India. But before doing trade with India, they need to take permission from India also. And you must know that during that period, Mughal rule was there in our country. Okay. So, company made enormous profits by buying Eastern goods and then selling them at higher prices in European market. So, what did it do? And earlier, they did not bring goods from uh, England or uh, European countries to sell over here. So, earlier, what did they do? They bought goods from India and sold them at higher price in European market. Okay, they purchased, they bought goods from Indian market at a lower price and then they sold to the European market at a high price. So, by doing so, they enjoyed or they earned enormous profit. Enormous means, enormous means huge, okay, extensive, huge profit. How? By buying Eastern goods and then selling them. So they bought goods from India, okay, in the Eastern part of the world and then they sold to European market. So you can see here yeah, one more thing before I go, why it was named English East India Company. So if you see the map of the world, entire map of the world, uh, that means uh, Britain is toward the West and India is toward the East. Okay, so they wanted to trade with India, so they named that company as a English East India Company. So India is towards the East, that is why it was named as East India Company. Okay, so by doing so, they earned huge profits. Okay, now you can see here, Queen received a share of the company's profit. So whatever business they did, whatever trade they did, whatever uh, profit was earned by the company, so certain percentage was given to the Queen as her share. Okay, so it is mentioned Queen received a share of company's profit certain amount was uh, the share of the queen. Now you can see here, English East India Company set up its first factory at Surat in 1612. 1612. So the question arises over here, in 1600 the company was formed, but the first factory was set up in 1612. Why so? Why there was a gap of 12 years? Why it happened so? Because within these 12 years, my dear, within these 12, in 1606 itself, they got the permission to trade. They were given the permission by the Mughal emperor. Okay. But uh, they established their factory in 1612. In between this, what they were doing? They were busy eliminating the other rivals. Okay. Portuguese were there, Dutch were there. So they were constantly in war with Dutch and the Portuguese. And after eliminating their rivals from India, finally in 1612, they established their first factory at a Surat. Okay, now you can see here, did they establish a factory, a factory, a place where uh, goods were produced? If anybody asks you, what is the meaning of factory, what will be your answer? Definitely you children will say, factory is a place where goods are produced. But here in this context, it is different. Okay, it was a trading settlement. 
consisting of warehouses that means factories where uh, that means warehouses where goods were uh, goods were kept okay office uh, keeping uh, office records were kept and it was also uh, uh, used as a residential quarters for the servants of the company the servants of the company they use it as a residential quarters okay the factory doesn't mean that goods were produced over there they brought goods from interior part of india they uh, kept it in that factory and from there they took it to european market and sold it over there okay later on after the industrial revolution also they brought goods from england they uh, kept it in uh, those factories and then they supplied in different different parts of the country okay children so residential quarters a place where british servants uh, lived okay nothing was manufactured it is mentioned over here nothing was manufactured nothing was manufactured okay so this is not working properly okay so i'll use this one so you see see here factories means nothing was manufactured in this uh, factories okay nothing was manufactured okay it was just used as a warehouse where goods were stored okay now in 1623 british had established their factories in surat brauj abadabad agra and basuli patnam these were the regions where british had successfully established their factories okay now you can see here this one name sir thomas rao he was a british ambassador to the court of jahangir during the time of jahangir sir thomas rao visited his court and he got concessions trading concession that means uh, he obtained many trade concessions for the company from the mughal emperor mughal emperor gave them many concessions to trade in india okay so they can they could easily trade without any obstacle they were given permission by the mughal emperor jahangir so thomas rao was a british ambassador to the court of jahangir okay now in 1639 now you can see here these three paragraphs are very very important in 1639 okay 1639 madras which now is chennai was given to british by a local ruler how did they acquire madras how madras came under their control in 1639 it was given to the british by a local ruler okay it was no, at that time it was known as madras now it is known as chennai okay and they established their trading settlement which was fortified and named it fort st george so madras was named as a fort st george they had built forts over there and it was named as fort st george so now madras is under their control okay they got it from the local ruler now in 1688 you can see here 1688 charles ii okay gave the company at a nominal rent of 10 pounds per year the island of bombay a bombay island bombay definitely is a island okay the island of bombay was given to given to the company okay it was given by charles ii he gave the company the island of bombay in a nominal rent of 10 pound okay so bombay how did bombay how did bombay became the uh, property of charles ii you can see here bombay was received as dowry when he married a portuguese princess when charles ii married a portuguese princess bombay was given to charles ii as a dowry so now bombay now is given to company and charles ii will get a rent of 10 pounds per year okay 10 pounds per year will be given to charles ii by the company as a rent okay and you can see here now so bombay also is now under the control of the company madras is also under the control of the company so madras and bombay now is the territory under whose control is india company's control now in 1690 in 1690 british trading settlement was established and fortified in calcutta so calcutta also now became their territory so it was named as fort william okay now you can see here this three paragraph paragraph number this this and this okay these three paragraphs uh, highlights how these three territories became the that means became the part of east india company 
or how did uh, uh, east india company acquire madras or how did uh, east india company acquire bombay or how did east india company acquire calcutta so madras was named as uh, fort st george okay and calcutta was named as fort uh, william okay now so all these three you can see uh, bombay madras bombay calcutta now became the headquarters of british settlements so these three territories these three parts of east india company became the headquarters of british settlements in the south west and east okay now you can see here if you check the map of uh, india madras is toward the south okay calcutta is toward the east and bombay is toward the west so these three parts madras bombay and calcutta became the headquarters of british settlements in the southern western and eastern regions of india respectively okay now this headquarters these three headquarters okay madras bombay and calcutta they became the they, this uh, headquarters later on came to be known as presidencies like uh, bombay presidency okay calcutta presidency and madras presidency okay and was placed under a governor okay these three presidencies were kept under the control of uh, governors okay madras bombay and calcutta now came to be known as presidencies okay because this were the headquarters of uh, the british settlements madras bombay and calcutta became the headquarter of the british settlements and it came to be known as presidencies which were kept under the control of a governor okay three governors one for bombay one for madras one for calcutta okay so this is the one how they acquired bombay madras and uh, calcutta okay now you can see here uh, in 1664 you can see uh, much later than the establishment of english east india company french east india company also was formed and they set up their they set up their uh, factories at uh, surat masuli patnam chandarnagar mahi okay and its headquarter india was pondicherry pondicherry was the headquarter only one headquarter was there english had three headquarters bombay calcutta and madras french had only one headquarter that was pondicherry and they had established their trading trading settlements at uh, surat also okay masuli patnam was there chandarnagar and mahi okay so french was one of the rival of east india company okay so when french came to india when french arrived in india british were already well settled along the coastal regions okay when french came to india as a trader at that time english had already settled themselves on uh, along the coastal regions okay so now the biggest issue was a uh, rivalry between both Ang anglo french rivalry so why there was a rivalry why there was a rivalry between uh, english and the french because both were both wanted to uh, establish their power in india they wanted to establish their power in india okay now you can see here why why there was a rivalry french and british were both equally determined to establish trade monopoly in india they wanted to establish their monopoly trade in india so what is the meaning of monopoly what is the meaning of monopoly exclusive control over the commodity or service that means only english wanted to acquire the entire monopoly right of india whereas uh, france also wanted the same thing so due to this uh, reason my dear uh, this both became the arch rivals okay they became the arch rivals of uh, arch rivals in trade and this rivalry eventually led to war so finally due to uh, both of these uh, companies wanted to establish their power in bengal or they wanted to acquire the monopoly trade over bengal or entire india that is why both were involved in a war okay so commercial rivalry led to war okay so you know that the three carnatic wars were fought okay how many wars were fought three carnatic wars were fought between england english and uh, french company and finally at the end english became successful and france was completely eliminated and english became the sole power in india as a trader okay and the dream of uh, french uh, for establishing an indian empire was completely vanished or scattered okay 
and this way british became the only power as a trader in india okay now rise of british power in bengal now you can see here uh, how bengal came under their control okay now you can see here uh, directly let us move on to this part <coughs> so all uh, right yeah so in the 18th century uh, bengal was one of the richest and the most fertile province in india bengal was one of the richest and the most fertile province in india okay that is why uh, english is a company concentrated more on bengal so bengal was uh, uh, one of the reason where they could uh, uh, find a profitable base by establishing trade and commerce okay the largest and the most prosperous of this european settlement was british settlement at calcutta okay so it was during the time of mughals that is in 1707 okay 1707 farooq shah was the mughal emperor and farooq shah issued a farman permission was given to the company to carry on duty free trade you can see here duty free trade in bengal that means duty free trade means they don't have to pay any taxes to the uh, mughal rule okay they don't have to pay taxes so duty free trade was given to the company to do carry on duty free trade in bengal bihar and odisha okay so it is mentioned over here this means that the company could export and import goods from uh, from and to this province without paying taxes to the government so they don't have to pay taxes to the government or the mughal the mughal emperor okay so this they were given the right to use passes or dastaks for the free movement of their goods so they can use passes or dastaks okay but one thing we must remember that this permission was given to the company okay this was given permission to carry on duty free trade was given to company only okay so it is mentioned company employees of the company were permitted to carry on private trade but they were not entitled the company's privileges okay duty free trade was only for the company companies uh, servants or the employees can also carry on private trade but they have to pay the taxes to the government they were not permitted to carry on trade without paying taxes okay so they had to pay taxes like the indian merchants so this facility was given duty free trade facility was given only to the company not to the company's employees okay so this way now they don't have to pay the uh taxes to the government so they earn enormous profits okay they you they earn huge profits did you understand now battle of plassey what was the background of battle of plassey you can see here you know that alwardi khan alwardi khan was uh, uh, appointed as a governor of bengal by the mughals but he declared himself as a independent ruler and he started to rule bengal independently okay now he ruled bengal as a independent ruler so after alwardi khan his son okay uh, sorry his uh, grandson siraj ud-daula alwardi khan had no son alwardi khan had no son so you may say then how grandson alwardi khan had a daughter okay so out of one daughter siraj ud-daula was uh, uh, chosen as uh, the uh, nawab of bengal okay another another cousin uh, suraj dalas cousin was uh, also there uh, due to that there was a problem that we will discuss now so in 1756 nawab of, uh, nawab of bengal arbaldi khan died and uh, suraj dawla succeeded him as the nawab of bengal okay now from the very beginning when siraj dawla became the nawab of bengal from the very beginning his terms with uh, english east india company was not at all good okay he was not happy with the conduct of english in bengal okay first of all you can see here what did uh, uh, siraj daula did siraj daula ordered the it is been said in history that uh, when uh, siraj daula became the nawab of bengal at that time it was customary to send gifts to the nawab but english did not uh, send any gifts to siraj daula that is why uh, siraj daula was annoyed okay so another reason is that uh, siraj ordered the british to pay taxes now siraj is ordering siraj ordered the british to pay taxes to him like other indian merchants pays but the british refused to do so okay when siraj daula became the nawab he ordered the britishers to pay taxes like other indian merchants 
British refused to do so. This angered the young Nawab. Okay, this made um, Siraj Dawla very much angry. So next one was that uh, as you know that uh, friends were also there during that time okay so when there was a rivalry and class going on between french company and the english company so you can see here uh, they both were busy uh, building forts okay you can see here uh, trading settlements under nagar the british began to fortify calcutta they started to build forts at calcutta so this uh, again made the nawab very much annoyed because this was directly uh, this was directly uh, attack on the sovereignty of nawab's uh, power that is why siraj was very much uh, annoyed with the act of uh, the english so siraj was uh, willing to let europeans to stay in his kingdom siraj was ready you stay in india you stay as a trader but you must uh, uh, you must be under my control you must follow my orders you must uh, follow what i do so he ordered both french and the company east india company to dismantle whatever uh, force they have built okay french uh, what was done french agreed okay french agreed but uh, british refused to dismantle the force built by them so this enraged siraj daula okay very angry siraj daula was very very angry with this uh, refusal from english company so now this was a direct and open challenge uh, regarding the authority i am the nawab and they are not listening to me they are directly challenging my authority as a nawab okay so what did uh, siraj daula do in 1756 he marched towards calcutta with a large army and captured fort william okay calcutta was captured by siraj daula in 1756 completely okay so later on in 1757 robert clive a hero of arcot okay in the carnatic wars robert clive emerged as a hero he was called from arcot and within few days fort william was conquered back okay fort william was reconquered fort william was conquered by robert clive without much difficulty okay now siraj daula what to do siraj daula had given all okay given in it all the demands of british company but uh, british however were not satisfied they had greater ambitions their objective was to replace siraj daula with a puppet ruler so siraj daula anyhow later on uh, understood the power and strength of the company company they said okay let it be no problem at all okay but uh, the demand of the company was uh, increasing day by day okay so now they conspired with uh, one of the general of uh, siraj daula army that was uh, mir jafar okay mir jafar was thrown over to his side mir jafar was uh, promised that uh, after defeating or killing siraj daula you will be made the nawab you will be made the nawab but this uh, uh, a contract between the english and mir jafar was uh, not at all known to siraj daula that is why when when they met in a battle of plassey when siraj daula met in a battle of plassey but at that time he realized that uh, siraj daula is betrayed by his own general mir jafar okay siraj daula was betrayed by his own general mir jafar so he understood so this is not a war this is a suicide for siraj daula so anyhow he tried to escape from the battle but later on he was executed you can see here battle of plassey was fought on 23rd june 1757 when was battle of plassey fought 1757 major part of nawab's army under the command of mir jafar did not take part in the battle so they were there but they did not take part in the battle they had already they were already uh, they already had uh, signed a secret pact with the english that uh, after siraj daula mir jafar is going to be the nawab of bengal so this way he understood nawab understood that uh, he had been betrayed so what was done you can see here realizing that he had been betrayed nawab fled from the battle pit it escaped from the battle pit later on he was captured and he was put to death so mir jafar betrayed him okay so mir jafar is own general betrayed uh, his nawab and he was captured and later on he was put to death and now mir jafar was proclaimed as the nawab of bengal so mir jafar now was made as the nawab of bengal okay so when mir jafar became the nawab of bengal after the battle of plassey 
what was the reaction what did he do he was very very happy he was very very happy he gave more and more concessions to the company you can see here english east india company was granted the undisputed right to free trade in bengal bihar and odisha duty free trade you can trade freely in bengal bihar and odisha permission was given by the nawab okay company also was given the zamindari right of 24 pargana zamindari right was given that means right to collect taxes from 24 pargana okay not only that you can see here mir zafar paid you can see here mir zafar paid the company and its official over 300 lakh rupees he was so happy he was so excited that he became the nawab so he is giving gifts he gave gifts to the company 300 lakh rupees he gave to the company and the officials of the company okay so this is the result of uh, the first battle of plassey so according to me my dear battle of plassey was never fought it was just a skirmism it was just because there was no uh, battle at all because nawab's army were not at all uh, participating in the battle that is why mirza par uh, siraj daula understood that uh, i am betrayed by my own general so he escaped okay so result you know now the importance of the battle so what happened after the battle of plassey first of all first importance is that uh, it paved the way for the establishment of british rule in bengal and eventually the rest of india first of all the door of bengal was open for east india company okay door of bengal was open to open for east india company and with this later on later on they became the ruler of the rest of the country okay now you can see here british that means english east india company came as a trader it was a trading company now you can see here it transport it, sorry okay you can see here it transformed the trading company trading company into a political power okay trading company now became a ruling company isn't it they assumed political power though they did not rule bengal directly they had a set up a puppet on the throne of bengal okay mirza far was a puppet whatever uh, english said they followed okay now nawab of bengal was reduced to a puppet you can see here puppet means uh, uh, we can say that uh, uh, will do or rule on the advice of the company okay so nawab of bengal was just for name sake the nawab of bengal with uh, no real powers with no real powers okay so entire power was in in the hands of british who became the virtual ruler the english did not become the physical ruler of uh, bengal yes i am the ruler of bengal they did not say they placed uh, uh, siraj daula as the nawab for the people and nawab followed the orders of uh, the company okay and the entire resources of bengal now was open for the company so uh, utilizing the resources of uh, bengal they became successful in the carnatic wars uh, which was fought with the uh, french uh, english east india uh, french company okay french uh, east india company now you can see here what about mir zafar did he continue to be the nawab of bengal So it is mentioned over here mir zafar was a weak ruler he could not take the decision because uh, you can say that his mind was paralyzed he was a ruler just for name sake he had a responsibility but no no power but english had a responsibility but no they uh, had the power but no responsibility you can see here mir zafar was a weak ruler he had a responsibility of ruling bengal but virtually no power to do so that means responsibility is with uh, mir zafar but no power okay on the other hand british had the power but no responsibility so now the wealth of bengal started to drain from bengal okay so british used their control over nawab to drain the wealth of bengal they simply demanded money cash from nawab and nawab kept on fulfilling the demands of the company okay so when mir zafar uh, failed to pay or meet the demands of uh, the company english got annoyed again and he was deposed he was removed and in place of mir zafar his son okay his son in law mir qasim was made the nawab mir qasim now failed to fulfill the demands of uh, the company so mir qasim the son in law of uh, the nawab 
Mirzapur was placed as a Nawab of Bengal. Okay, so now when Mir Qasim became the Nawab of Bengal, okay, what did Mir Qasim do again? Mir Qasim rewarded the company by granting it Jamindari. Now you can see here, slowly and gradually they are getting more and more, uh, that means Jamindari rights. Okay, of Bardhawan, Midnapur and Chittagon. They got the Jamindari right of uh, Bardhawan, Midnapur and Chittagon. Okay, so British trading company had successfully transformed itself uh, into a kingmaker. Now they are the one uh, deciding who is going to be the next uh, ruler. So Mir Jafar was placed by the English East India Company and Mir Qasim again is placed by replacing Mir Qasim by the company. So now they have become the uh, kingmaker. Okay. So now you can see Battle of Bagzar. But you know that Mir Qasim was a he wanted to rule Bengal independently. Okay, he was a competent and efficient ruler. He knew that he can manage all the affairs of the affairs of Bengal properly. So he was determined to free him. I don't want to be under the grip of the company. I want to rule Bengal freely. He was very much determined from the very beginning. Okay, so soon he came in conflict with the British. So when Britishers came to know that uh, Mir Qasim is trying to go against uh, the company, so they met uh, and was defeated. Okay, so Mir Qasim was defeated. Okay, so it is you can see here. Mir Qasim was defeated in 1763 and Mir Qasim fled away. Okay, Mir Qasim now was defeated and again Mir Jafar was placed on the throne. Okay, earlier Mir Jafar was there. Mir Jafar, when he could not fulfill the demands of the company, Mir Qasim was made the Nawab of Bengal. Now, when Mir Qasim is trying to go against the company, once again, after defeating Mir Qasim, Mir Jafar is placed on the throne of Bengal. So, Mir, Qasim, Mir, Jafar, is, uh, Mir Jafar became the Nawab of Bengal once again. So, now what to do? What happened with Mir, uh, Mir Qasim? Mir Qasim was very much determined. He went to Awadh, okay. He escaped to Awadh where he formed an alliance. So after that uh, war, a small war between uh, company and uh, Mir Qasim, he fled away to Awadh and he met with uh, the Nawab of Awadh, okay, and the Mughal emperor. These three, uh, three made an alliance, okay. He escaped to Awadh where he formed an alliance, friendship, alliance means friendship, with Sujaud Dawla or uh, the Nawab of Awadh. So Zawad Dawla was the Nawab of Awadh and uh, Sa Alam was the Mughal Emperor. So Mir Qasim, so Zawad Dawla, the Nawab of Awadh and Sa Alam, the Mughal Emperor, these three, three of them, they made an alliance. This combined forces of three met in 1764 in Baksar and a battle of Baksar was fought. Okay, so in this battle, my dear, once again, British became victorious. Okay, British became victorious. So here, this victory proved to be very, very beneficial for the English. It is mentioned over here, victory of British in the Battle of Bagzar firmly established them a master of Bengal, Bihar and Odisha. Now, after the victory in the Battle of Bagzar, they became the master not only of Bengal, but also of Bihar and Odisha. Okay, they even got the political influence and control over our then Mughal Emperor. Now they could control the rest of the part of the country itself. Okay, so it is mentioned, it led the foundation. Okay, you can see here, it led the foundation of uh, British rule in India. Okay, British rule in India. So I told you, you know, Battle of uh, Plassey opened the gate of Bengal and victory in the Battle of Bagzar made them the ruler of, uh, ultimate ruler of uh, India. Okay. Now you can see here, Treaty of Allahabad. So after the Battle of Baksar, after the Battle of Baksar, Treaty of Allahabad was signed between Sujaud Dawla, the Nawab of Awadh and the Mughal Emperor Salam II. Okay, so 1765, Robert Clive signed the Treaty of Allahabad with Sujaud Dawla and Salam II. So what was agreed in, what were the terms of uh, uh, Allah, that means uh, Treaty of uh, Allahabad, you can see here. Awad was returned to Sujaud Dawla. Awad was returned to Sujaud Dawla. You rule independently. But in uh, in favor of that, uh, two districts of Kora and Allahabad were given to Nawab. 
Okay, you can see here. Yeah, Allahabad was returned to Sujaud Dawla. However, the two districts of Kora and Allahabad were taken away from Nawab. So, Kora and Allahabad was taken away from Nawab. Okay, next one. Nawab of Awad had to pay a war indemnity compensation of how many? 50 lakhs rupees to the company. Nawab had to, okay, Nawab had to pay to the company. Next one, British agreed to defend the Nawab of Awad against his enemies. Whoever enemies were of a Nawab will be protected by the company. Okay, and Nawab would have to pay the cost of British troops. So Nawab's, Nawab of Awad will be protected against his enemies, but uh, the cost of bearing, okay, a British troops would have to be bared by whom? By the Nawab. Okay, so. Awad now became a very small buffer state between British position in Bengal and Marathas. Now, what about Salam II? Okay, Salam, British gave Salam to the uh, districts of Kora and Allahabad. Kora and Allahabad was taken from Nawab and was given to Salam. And the annual pension of 26 lakh rupees. You can see here, British gave Salam to the districts of Kora and Allahabad and the annual pension of 26 lakh rupees. Okay. Kora and Allahabad was taken from Nawab and was given to Salam second. Okay, and annual pension of Rs. lakh rupees has to be paid to the company by Salam. Okay, so in this way, in this way, now you can see here in return, Mughal Emperor Salam II granted the company Diwani. You can see here Diwani of Bengal, Bihar, and Odisha. So, what is the meaning of Diwani? Right to collect revenue from these provinces. Now, before they were allowed to do duty-free trade, now they are given the permission to collect taxes also from Bengal, Bihar and Odisha. You can see, phase by phase, the company is uh, trying, uh, that means company is becoming successful in its uh, ambitions. Okay. So, this is all about uh, Mirzafar. Okay. Now, you can see here, uh, Mirzafar is placed. You can see here. Uh, Mir Qasim is defeated uh, in the uh, Battle of Bagzar. Now, Mir Zafar is made the Nawab of Bengal again. Okay. So, in 1765, uh, Mir Zafar died and his son was made the Nawab of Bengal. Okay. His son was made the Nawab of Bengal. Okay. So, this is all about uh, the history of uh, Bengal. You can see, this is the map of... Uh, map of India. This part is British territory. Okay. British territory. Nizam territory is this one. Okay. Mysore is here. Okay. And Maratha territory. You can see here. So, now all together you can see British had captured this territory. They are now the ultimate rulers of this part. Blue is part. So, after this they had to bring Marathas under their control. Nizam, Mysore. So, Anglo Maratha wall will be there. And that means Anglo, uh, that means a war with the Nizams of Hyderabad. Okay. Anglo Martha war was there. Then uh, Anglo Mysore war was there. Later on, after this, uh, we will study about uh, Anglo Martha war, Anglo Mysore war. Okay. Then the uh, Niz war with Nizam of Hyderabad also. So, this is the territory they now are the masters. So, Bengal, Bihar, Odisha. Okay. This is the reason. This is the reason. Okay. This is the reason. Okay. So now they have established a dual government. They have established a dual government. Dual government means uh, Nawab is the ruler with the responsibility but uh, no power. Okay. So now Bengal, Bengal had how many masters? Two masters. Nawab and the company. Okay, very simple. Nawab was responsible for general administration, maintenance of law and order and justice. Okay, division of power between the Nawab and the company. Bengal was ruled by two masters, Nawab and the company. Nawab first master, second master is the company. So, how was the division of work done? General administration, maintenance of law and order and justice was the responsibility of Nawab. And company had military power and right to collect uh, and uh, reduce the revenue of Bengal. Right to collect taxes was the uh, sole uh, authority of the company. So they will collect the revenue and use it. Uh, okay. So this was the arrangement. The entire this is the arrangement known as a dual 
government okay you can see here company enjoyed power without any responsibility and i told you earlier no nawab had the responsibility but no power company had the power but no responsibility so ultimately who was uh, uh, most the sufferer that was the nawab nawab was just a puppet okay cut quickly we call it no they, he was uh, moved the way the british liked okay the revenue was collected by indian officials appointed by the so this is all about uh, english east india companies uh, set up of their set up of uh, rule in india okay so finally in 19, 1772 okay 1770 dual government ended where an asting became okay so you can see here this uh, here it is you can go through it the governors of bengal robert clive okay so these are the names of the governors of bengal these are the governor generals of india because till 1773 no they only had a control over bengal so they were the governors of bengal but later on they became rest of the territory also was brought under their control so governor general of india you can see once again governors of bengal only because till then only bengal was their territory on which they ruled but later on after 73 they became the ruler of bengal itself no that is why governor general so were an asking is there okay and last governor general okay uh, not last governor second last governor general was uh, lord dalhousie after him lord canning okay so this is all about uh, battle of plassey and battle of bagzer so in this chapter we studied about uh, how british okay became the real masters of bengal and eventually of whole of india okay so two important battles battle of plassey and battle of bagzer okay bagzer is very very important to be noted over here importance of battle of plassey and importance of battle of bagzer okay a trading company became the master of bengal and later on of whole of india okay students so i hope you all have understood it okay so this is the completion of our chapter number 7 okay so hope you all have understood it if you still have any doubt you can contact me you can uh, ask your questions in the comment box so this was for today we'll meet again in the next class till then take care stay safe bye bye